By now, you've probably heard of Jen Psaki's response to a question about Texas standing up to Biden's threatened vaccine mandates. She stated that federal law trumps state law. I guess it's true that the best lie should contain a bit of truth, but today let's answer the question of whether federal law always trumps state law. Let's do so by looking at the original document so we can answer this question not only when it comes to vaccine mandates, but all of the acts coming out of Washington, D.C. So we'll do that next on The Constitution Study. Hello there, everyday Americans, and welcome to the Constitution Study. This is where we read and study the Constitution. We teach rising generation to be free. I'm glad you could join me. As always, for more information, head to constitutionstudy.com. You can find out all the work that I'm doing, find out where I'm speaking, read my articles, watch these videos, ask a question, generally get engaged. Now, I'll talk a bit more about that website and some other things at the end of the video. But for now, let's talk about this idea of federal supremacy. When Ms. Psaki talks about federal law trumping state law, she was referring to the Supremacy Clause, found in Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution of the United States. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. To understand this clause, we need to break it down. The Supremacy Clause lists three things that are the supreme law of the land. First, the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. That's pretty simple. Second, the laws of the United States are supreme, but not all laws of the United States. See, only the laws of the United States made pursuant to the Constitution are considered supreme, meaning laws done in consequence or prosecution of anything, hence agreeable or conformable. Since only the laws of the United States made pursuant or conformable to the Constitution are given the high place of supreme law of the land, we've already shown that Ms. Psaki's statement isn't entirely correct. Before we get into that, though, let's look at the third thing that's the supreme law of the land. Treaties made under the authority of the United States are also considered supreme. Now, where does the United States get its authority? From the Constitution, of course. Together, we see a hierarchy of supremacy. At the top is the Constitution of the United States. Then, below that document, we have the U.S. laws made pursuant to it and treaties made under the authority granted by it. With that in mind, let's look at the question of Biden's vaccine mandates and Texas's response to it. The Governor Abbott issued Executive Order GA40, which reads, No entity in Texas can compel receipt of a COVID-19 vaccine by any individual, including an employee or a customer, who objects to such vaccination for any reason of personal conscience based on a religious belief or for medical reasons, including prior recovery from COVID-19. I hereby suspend all relevant statutes to the extent necessary to enforce this prohibition. So here we have two competing orders, one from the government of Washington, D.C., telling private companies they must require vaccines, the other from the government of Texas saying they can't. So which one wins? Well, let's start with the federal question. President Biden announced his intention to sign an executive order requiring employers with more than 100 employees mandate COVID-19 vaccinations as a condition of employment. While I have yet to find the actual executive order, the Occupations Safety and Health Association, or OSHA, a division of the Department of Labor, has proposed regulations putting President Biden's intention into law. But is that the supreme law of the land? Well, to answer that, we have to answer two questions. Is this regulation law, and was it made in pursuance of the Constitution? Now, law is defined as a rule, particularly an established or permanent rule, prescribed by the supreme power of a state to its subjects for regulating their actions, particularly their social actions. So is an OSHA regulation a rule prescribed by a supreme power of a state or to its subjects? I'd say yes. The government of the United States has delegated the power to establish rules for regulating actions, but is this rule made pursuant to the Constitution? See, here's where Ms. Psaki's statement falls apart. First, Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 of the Constitution states, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Now, legislative powers are defined as capable of enacting laws as legislative power. If all legislative power, the power of enacting laws, is delegated to Congress, 
how can OSHA, which is a part of the executive branch, enact law? Sure, when Congress passed the legislation that created OSHA, they gave their creation regulatory power. However, the Constitution does not authorize Congress to delegate its legislative power, so that legislation was not made pursuant to the Constitution. Furthermore, while I haven't read the legislation, I've been told that creating vaccine mandates is not a power Congress supposedly gave to OSHA. Being pursuant to the Constitution is not only simply about the question of Congress delegating its lawmaking power to the executive branch. Enter the Tenth Amendment. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. In order for a law to be made pursuant to the Constitution, it must enact a power delegated to the United States by the Constitution. Now, look all you want, but you will not find the power to regulate private businesses or their employees delegated to the United States. Neither is the power to regulate the health care decisions for millions of Americans delegated to the United States. Now, since the Tenth Amendment states that powers not delegated to the United States are reserved to others, any legislation Congress may pass to enact those powers is not pursuant to the Constitution. So where does that leave Biden's mandate? Well, according to Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Paper No. 78, there is no position which depends on clearer principles than that every act of a delegated authority, contrary to the tenor of the commission under which it is exercised, is void. So if every act of a delegated authority contrary to its commission is void, what does that say about OSHA's regulation? For that matter, what does it say about the legislation that created OSHA without that power being delegated to the United States? Continuing the Alexander Hamilton quote, no legislative act, therefore, contrary to the Constitution, can be valid. To deny this would be to affirm that the deputy is greater than his principal, that the servant is above his master, that the representatives of the people are superior to the people themselves, that men acting by virtue of powers may do not only what their powers do not authorize, but what they forbid. So if the legislative act that created OSHA cannot be valid, meaning the agency itself is invalid, how can a regulation they promulgate be valid? To claim that anything OSHA does is valid means they're not only doing what they're not authorized to do, but what they are forbidden to do. Now, Mr. Hamilton pointed out that this idea that the federal government can do whatever it wants, even in contradiction to the Constitution that created it, is ridiculous. The very idea that the representatives of the people are superior to the people was as unthinkable to Mr. Hamilton as your deputy being superior to the sheriff or a servant being superior to their master. Yet that is the state of affairs today in America. Now, you may point out that the Federalist Papers are not law. Rather, they are commentaries in support of ratification of the Constitution as originally presented to the states. However, this idea that congressional acts are contrary to the Constitution or void was recognized by the Supreme Court. Certainly, all those who have framed written constitutions contemplate them as forming the fundamental and paramount law of a nation. And consequently, the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. So if the act of the legislature that created OSHA is repugnant to the Constitution, which I have already shown makes it void, where does that leave the vaccine mandate and the Texas executive order? Now, at first, you may think this proves the Texas executive order wins the battle. Before you jump to that conclusion, though, let's take a look at it again. No entity in Texas can compel the receipt of a COVID-19 vaccine by any individual, including an employee or a consumer, who objects to such vaccination for any reason of personal conscience based on a religious belief or for a medical reason, including prior recovery from COVID-19. I hereby suspend all relevant statutes to the extent necessary to enforce this prohibition. The problem with the Texas executive order is not that it's superseded by federal law, but that it violates the constitutions of both Texas and the United States. It's perfectly legal for Texas to tell Washington, D.C. that their mandate violates the agreement the states have and therefore cannot be enforced within their state. However, neither the state nor the federal government have the authority to deprive private business owners control of those businesses. Both constitutions prohibit depriving these business owners of the property they have in their businesses, including control of those businesses. So Ms. Pazaki is wrong. Not all laws in the United States are superior to state laws. Of course, that doesn't mean that the Texas executive order doesn't have its problems as well. Either way, knowing what the Constitution actually says makes all the difference in the world. 
Perhaps if the administrations in both Austin and Washington, D.C. read and studied the constitutions they took an oath to support, we would have fewer of these conflicts and illegal orders. So as we see, Jen Psaki is wrong. She's flat out wrong. Not all federal laws trump state laws. Then again, what Texas did, well, it wasn't much better. So we end up with this question, what do we do? I'm more than happy to see Texas, and in fact, all the 50 states, to look at Washington, D.C., tell President Biden as an executive administration, pound sand. We didn't delegate to you the authority to regulate our businesses that way. Sure, Congress can regulate interstate commerce, but we're not talking interstate commerce. We didn't authorize this. You don't have this power. It's, your order is meaningless and void. In fact, if you try to enforce it within our state, well, we'll just arrest you. I'd be happy to see that. I would be thrilled to see that. Then again, Texas jumped the shark. They, they went too far. I understand the sentiment, right? You're very upset about mandates, and I don't think businesses should be implementing vaccine mandates either. But there's a difference between what I think someone should do and what they're legally allowed to do. It's one of the reasons why I'm not flying at the moment, because I don't trust these businesses, these private airlines, to not force a vaccine on me if they want me, if I want to fly. So I just won't do business with them. Sure, it's been inconvenient, but in many ways it's been a lot of fun. I've been I've seen so much more of the country by driving rather than by flying. That doesn't mean I don't want to fly. I, I'd love the opportunity to fly. If if I had my druthers, I'd have my own plane and fly myself around, but that's not the way things are. But back to this question of mandates. See, it's not just states that have the legal authority to tell Washington to pound sand. These business owners do as well. So if all these corporations that have implemented these mandates, especially before the law was even put in place, the regulation was put in place, well, I'm wondering how many people who understand the Constitution actually own that stock. If you own stock in one of these companies, show up at their board, at their stockholders meeting, ask them why they jumped the gun, implemented a vaccine mandate based solely on a press conference without any rules or regulation put in place, which rules and regulations, by the way, are illegal, unconstitutional, and therefore void. Ask them. See what you get for an answer. If you don't like the answer, you know, you get that little thing in the mail to vote, vote for different board members. If these companies will not protect your rights, why do we do business with them? I know it's getting harder and harder to find places to do business, but what is your liberty worth? What is your children's liberty worth? If you will sell their futures for the conveniences of today, well, then you're no different than Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of stew. We have to decide what is more important to us, our liberty or convenience. Yes, it's going to be hard. Our founding fathers pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to the idea of independence. Can't we do something similar today? Can't we deal with this problem when we can still deal with it at the ballot box and not have to fight a war over it? I, I keep bringing this up because to me, it's the obvious outcome. If we don't fight to protect our rights today, our children will have to fight tomorrow. Today, we can do it at the ballot box. Tomorrow, it'll have to be done on the battlefield. And if we make them fight to regain the rights that we were too lazy to protect for them, they will curse us. Now, if you want to find out more, again, go to constitutionstudy.com. I've announced a new program. I'm going to be doing an online constitution study. We're going to go through each and every clause of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It is a great opportunity to not simply learn about the Constitution, but have the chance to discuss it and debate it with others as well. Now, you can find out more at constitutionstudy.com slash study. So be sure to head over there, read more about it, register for it, reserve your seat. Seating is limited. I'm probably going to start this sometime early January. I want to give people a chance to get started, and I don't want to interfere with our holiday revelries. But you want to register before the class fills up, because once I'm out of space, I'm out of space. And all the benefits you get from signing up early, well, you'll have missed them. So check that out. Also, check out constitutionscholars.com, because I'm going to be extending that Constitution study into the Scholars program. It's going to be a, a, a course on Constitution Scholars. There'll be a community group there. There's a lot of great stuff there as well. These websites are set up to help you, to give you information, to help you share information, to help you learn and engage. So when somebody like a Jen Psaki says something as stupid as, 
federal law trumps state law? Well, you know that she's wrong. And if you found this worth the time, worth the effort, do me a favor, subscribe, rate this video, rate the podcast, share this episode with others, help others understand the truth as well. And if you would come back here next time for the Constitution Study. Thing you have to-